I think we're officially recording. Um, first off, thank you everyone for joining this morning. Um, we, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Caroline Luxoy and I'm the Broadband and Telecommunications Project Manager for DHCD. Um, I, along with Kyle Rosner, helped to coordinate and facilitate the VLBN. And we had heard from a large number of you all that this was certainly an area of significant interest. Um, so we put this call together and um, fair warning, we are not in a position that we are able to advise um, you. The only, the only person that should really be advising you on what is an allowable CARES Act expense um, is your, your county attorney. And I'm sure that Evan will probably mention that here in a few moments. But um, so, so our goal for this call is not to advise you as much as it is to um, sort of facilitate a brainstorming session here and uh, share some share some information with you all from people who have have a plan in place or um, are are dealing with the the CARES Act and have been willing to share some some of their information. Um, so we just have one slide today, and you're seeing it now because again, you know, the hope is that this will be more of a discussion than a presentation. Um, so just a, a brief overview of the lineup today. In just a second, I'm going to hand it over to the Chief Broadband Advisor, Evan Feynman. Um, we'll hear from Jeremy Bennett from VACO, Cindy Church from the Library of Virginia, and then we'll hear from two localities, Arlington and Fauquier, about their plans for their CARES Act funds. Um, and then uh, Mike Culp has graciously agreed to uh, help facilitate the open mic portion of this call. So um, we're going to open it up to you guys during that session, during that portion, and I'll let Mike kind of explain um, the process there. So if everybody can mute themselves, um, and then we can open it up during that part. Um, so I think the logistics are out of the way. Evan, are you on? I am, yes, Caroline. Okay, take it away. Sure thing. Uh, well, so first of all, thank you everybody for joining the call. Um, obviously this is a, a hot topic, um, nothing quite like uh, dealing with uh, heavily regulated, sudden uh, federal dollar infusions uh, and a bunch of questions about them. Um, as Caroline said, uh, we a lot of the questions that we've gotten, uh, unfortunately, I have to give you this unsatisfactory answer, which is uh, I cannot, uh, nor can anybody at the state level say, you know, give you a, a check or a gold star and say, yeah, this uh, project is or isn't a CARES Act eligible project for local funding. Um, uh, as Caroline said, you know, we're not your attorneys when it comes to, uh, evaluating federal law, uh, you need to talk to your county or city attorney. Uh, but, you know, to the extent there's safety in numbers, I'd encourage you guys to, to listen to what other folks are doing, uh, to tailor your projects to match. Uh, there are a few pretty clear rules that have come out from, uh, treasury and, uh, otherwise I just want to say you know, this is a great opportunity and do be forward looking. Uh, one of the things that is incredibly frustrating in this space is that uh, we have, when we look back at the Recovery Act, which is the last time the feds dropped a ton of money on us, uh, many of the investments that were made there were not always the wisest. And so, you know, be thoughtful, think about what's going to be, yes, something that, that meets the requirement that it addresses COVID-related issues now, but uh, do try to make sure that the investments also are things that will pay dividends moving forward. Uh, otherwise, uh, please reach out to the team with any specific challenges or questions you've got, and I look forward to the discussion today. And that's all I got. Thanks, Evan. Uh, let's see. Jeremy, are you on the line? Hey, Carolyn. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just thank you for the um, opportunity to speak to you all, and thank you for DHCD for providing forum for this discussion. Uh, really happy to be on the call, share what we know, and more importantly, to hear what folks um, from folks what they're doing in their own communities. I believe I'm joined on the call by my colleagues Joe Lurch and uh, Katie Boyle. Um, I'll just second some of the comments that Evan made regarding uh, CARES Act allocations and guidance. Um, anything that we advice that we give is not meant as legal counsel. Um, if counties have specific questions that aren't answered by the federal guidance, uh, we also encourage them to reach out to their um, local legal counsel for advice. And um, we have published the federal guidelines through our newsletter and our, uh, our website. Uh, two points that I'm sure you all have looked at are the in the frequently asked questions section are, uh, could fund payments be used for capital improvement projects that broadly provide potential economic development in the community? Um, the response is in general, no, but they also say fund payments may be used for the expenses uh, for measures to increase COVID-19 treatment capacity or improve mitigation measures, including related construction costs. So there's, you know, the, we think there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, also the FAQ that asks, may recipients use fund payments to expand rural broadband capacity to assist with distance learning and telework. Um, it says such expenditures would only be permissible if they're necessary for the public health emergency. Uh, the costs of projects that would not be expected to increase capacity to a significant extent uh, until the need for distance learning and telework have passed due to this public health emergency would not be necessary due to the public health emergency and thus would not be eligible use of fund payments. Um, just one point, given the school reopening guidance that came out recently uh, from the Department of Education and the governor's office, uh, in which school divisions will be reopening under a phased approach that requires both in-person and distance learnings. Uh, personally, I think there might be some wiggle room uh, for use of funds that would aid in that endeavor. Um, because even if the emergency passes, it seems that a lot of school divisions are going to be reliant upon uh, distance learning going forward. Um, we had sent a letter to Secretary Lane requesting additional guidance on several issues that are not addressed in detail um, in Treasury's guidance or FAQs, mostly with respect to the types of documentation that the state plans to require from local governments to demonstrate that the funds were used for eligible purposes. Um, we had received a response and circulated that information with uh, local finance directors, but unfortunately it doesn't provide much more additional clarity. So just to reiterate, um, we encourage you to work with your legal counsel on any specific questions. Um, and then one thing I do want to note, yesterday in his presentation to House Appropriations, Secretary Lane, in response to a question from Delegate Bloxham, did indicate that CARES Act funds spent by December 30th in relation to broadband projects helping uh, mitigate the impact of COVID-19, whether that's telework or distance learning, uh, could potentially be eligible as long as they are related to COVID-19 response and completed by December 30th. Uh, so just additional background. And lastly, I'll just, uh, I know we have some school folks on the call. One additional area, I know a lot of you are doing this already, but I would encourage you to work with your um, school division superintendents and school boards. Uh, there are multiple funding pots through the CARES Act. Uh, one of them is the $214 million in federal funding that's dispersed to local school divisions directly uh, based on uh, Title I allocation formulas. And then also the Governor Northam recently announced the use of additional um, CARES Act funding through the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund uh, to the tune of $43.4 million. And of that amount includes uh, 26.9 million that will be used to support short-term and long-term initiatives expanding high-speed internet access. So uh, I think the key here is collaborating um, at all levels of government and using multiple funding opportunities. But again, um, we encourage you to work with your attorneys and certainly if you have questions, reach out to the VACO staff. We're happy to keep publishing information as we receive it and uh, appreciate all the work you're doing. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Carolyn. Thanks, Jeremy. And I'm going to hand it right on over to Cindy. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Thanks again, Carolyn, for um, facilitating this discussion and everyone else who helped as well. I represent um, I the Library of Virginia. I'm the continuing education consultant, but I'm also the state D-Ray coordinator. I work closely with the 93 public library systems to ensure they um, are, are uh, um, can get E-rate funding for their public libraries to help offset costs of um, internet and any um, associated costs with that. So that's a side note, but also wanted to make sure that you were aware and, um, and specifically about a couple of things. Um, public libraries, like everybody, are sort of scrambling and the rules change every day, but I want to, to know that your public libraries are a vital community partner in this effort to try to help with distance learning, 
to help with them specifically in the body grant and asked for describing digital literacy efforts such as the local library. Local libraries have been doing this forever. So the local public libraries are your partner in this process. And as part of that process, they are um, doing things already before this pandemic happened, like loaning mobile hotspots. So a lot of public libraries are doing that already. So if you if that's something you want to do with the CARES Fund, they already have a process in place. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, most public libraries are also offering um, have the Wi-Fi in their parking lots turned on 24-7. They are also, some are going around with vans, specifically one that comes to mind is Leonsburg Regional Library that are set up with multiple um, um, hotspots and, and information so they can, people can get connected to Wi-Fi. Public libraries are also providing mobile printing for um, patrons. So if someone needs to print something to verify a job application or just anything in general, they can do that wirelessly as well. Um, and some libraries are doing curbside pickup as well. So just, just please, you know, we want the libraries are there. They're already doing these kind of things. And I would um, want to tell you to include them. We did get some CARES funding at the Library of Virginia. Not a whole lot, but we are targeting library systems specifically that are receiving um, higher SNAP benefits, unemployment, and low broadband connectivity just to get them some things that they may need, like PPE, um, lockers that they can put holes in or hot spots in, or disaster planning. So we've identified 20 public library systems that would potentially be receiving direct grants to help them in their efforts. So if you have any questions, please reach out to me and I will um, pass it back to Caroline. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. And I think that's a great reminder. We had heard from a number of you all that um, some of the things that you were considering for CARES Act were um, uh, hotspots or um, more Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi areas. Uh, so I think Cindy brought up a good um, a good note that be sure to check with your library um, just in case there's any overlapping initiatives there. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Holly with Arlington County. Let me get myself off mute. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. We're going to dig into the, the weeds a little bit about our, our project. So. I'm Holly Hartel. I am the Assistant CIO for Strategic Initiatives for Arlington County, which is up in the northern part of Virginia, um, for those who might not be aware. Uh, to give you a, a brief background of, of our effort is that we at the county have been working for, uh, I guess, the past two years with a, a cross uh, departmental group around digital equity. Um, so libraries, our human services department, our um, community planning, housing and development, communications, parks and, and schools. So we've been building a relationship to understand what the needs were and, and kind of work towards a common goal. Um, we we'd had a plan and we still have plans in place to try to expand um, our efforts around digital equity. When the COVID-19 crisis occurred, we realized we had heard from several other uh, local jurisdictions across the country of some of the things that they were doing to immediately use this opportunity to put in place some actions that could help. It was becoming very evident that the digital divide and lack of access was going to be critical as we move to um, working from home, staying from home. So in part of our conversations um, with schools, we knew that the schools and libraries were offering um, MiFi devices. Um, the schools, the, the purpose of the MiFi devices had been in existence since well before COVID, but really the intention of the use was in a homework setting, not 100% distance learning. And what they were finding as we moved into the distance learning is that the, the, the data caps um, were negatively impacting the students. And as we had had a relationship with them, understanding that it's not just the student that's impacted, it's the family. And you can't separate 
the fact that the family has needs and the student has needs. So focusing on a, on a MiFi device that supports the student might seem like it was going to work on paper, but in reality, it was having a negative impact on everybody. Um, so we knew we needed to look at something else. We have longer term goals of, of doing something with our fiber infrastructure, but in the short term, we needed to provide the access. Um, schools had already begun a, a conversation of realizing what could they, they do. Um, so I just want to highlight that, that I am the person speaking, but I'm definitely not, we did not do this alone. We worked very closely with schools to make this happen. Um, what was nice about our effort is that we were able with data to identify who our target population was and what we were trying to do. So our goal was to focus on families of free and reduced lunch and individuals at a bare minimum who had requested um, the MiFi devices in distance learning at a maximum to be able to serve all of those families in um, the Arlington Public School System who have um, free and reduced lunch or uh, use other programs to support families in need. We, as we began discussing our, our program, we quickly um, realized that we needed to engage a partner and we started talking with Comcast. So we worked with Comcast to come up with a brief uh, one and a half page outline of what our proposal was. The proposal was to make sure that those students um, had the capacity to perform distance learning. We made sure that our eligibility requirements for the county aligned with Comcast language. Um, and we came up with a high level of, of process and roles and proposed that to the, the, the county board and, and to the county manager who brought it with the county board. What was really helpful was the manager and board level interest in moving forward. All of that happened, and I haven't yet mentioned the CARES funding, is that we proposed this and then the, the CARES funding was selected as, as an option to use for the effort. Um, it, it, in my mind, it, it, it aligns. I mean, it's facilitating distance learning um, during COVID. We hadn't planned it prior to the, the budget. It wasn't included in our budget prior to March 27th. Um, and the expenses are going to begin being incurred um, in the next couple of weeks. So we felt comfortable that this was a, a, a way for us to move forward. Um, one of the things that I, as we were discussing and we're still working through the details of the process and, and the policy is that we did make some decisions um, and it was helpful to have everybody on board. For instance, Right now, we have families who are on Comcast Internet Essentials already and are already bearing the burden. We made the decision that if the family is on Comcast Internet Essentials and they share their information with us, we can then take over that cost for the life of the contract. So the contract will be covering um, the next school year um, to make sure that we're not cutting off any, any coverage. And it will be a partnership between the, the county and schools to manage the execution and, and monitoring and gathering of the, of the data. Um, so we're working right now on not only a press release, um, we had one press release, but a more detailed press release, but also the, the process. One of the things that Comcast um, does for this is, is a, I think it's a two year program for Comcast to partner with um, localities to make this happen. So we're all learning some things, but there is a process that Comcast has around how they give the, the locality codes that can be distributed to families in order to submit online or call in for eligibility. We're working through how do you uh, distribute those codes? What's the best way to make sure that the families who are, we are intended to market toward are aware of this? Um, so we have several different ap avenues partnering with um, the schools, partnering with our libraries, um, partnering with uh, human services and others to help make sure that we're getting out the word within the county. Um, a couple of things that you know we're learning or working through is not only the communication, but what level of support will be needed? And how do you make sure that you address not only the child need, but the family need? And this is where our libraries is going to play a, a big role is 
there are there's guidance that the uh, schools has there's guidance that the libraries has regarding internet safety that we're packaging together to be able to communicate um, we're also working on a, an FAQ to make sure that we have both an internal FAQ and an external FAQ to be able to satisfy questions of how this could potentially be used. Um, and then we're also working through to make sure that we're getting the data to measure the success of the program and working with Comcast to make sure that they're providing us the information that will give us a, enough to know what, what's next. Where, where are the gaps? What do we need to do? Um, so I feel very satisfied that we will be able to get that information to progress forward. A couple of things that we've learned in going through this effort, I mean, some of them are, are the same things you, you hear um, across any successful project, the, the leadership support. Um, we came up with this proposal um, shortly after we were at, um, at the stay-at-home uh, measure from the governor. But to be able to move it through from not only a idea, but a, a buy-in and a, a funding mechanism in a short amount of time, basically I'd say where we are, you're looking at six weeks, um, that takes leadership. That takes the executive leadership to be able to help make sure these things are happening. We have all of the right people um, on the phone calls to resolve all of the little details. Um, so I think that's very, very telling in, in how we're able to move forward. The other thing is that the right people are involved in the process at the right time. We made sure that the attorneys, we made sure that communications, we made sure that the finance department, that everybody was weighing in and giving us the input that we needed to ask the right questions early enough um, to be able to be, feel comfortable moving forward. Um, having procurement involved from schools early on in the process and involving our procurement when necessary from the county perspective and their availability has been really helpful. Um, I also think that in, as we're going through, what we've been doing is keeping a log and asking questions and the different pers perspectives from the libraries, from human services, from schools, from communications has helped ensure that we're crafting um, a process that will be as simple and remove as many barriers as possible to allow as many people to use the service. Um, and I think it's also the partnership with Comcast. I think that they've done a fabulous job in working with us um, to be able to make sure once they've got the right people and are answering the questions to ensure that this is a successful program. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions later when we move on, but that was a highlight of what we've done. Thanks, Holly. Um, I think we'll hold off on questions until the open mic portion. And then um, so everyone be thinking of your questions and just hold on to them for now. Um, and we'll we'll move on to Aaron with Fauquier County. Good morning. Um, so just perspective of where we're at. Fauquier County is kind of on the peripheral of northern Virginia. We are a little bit different than those localities to our north. We have smaller population, but we have a very large land mass. Um, we're one of the largest counties in Virginia. We have about 71,000 citizens. Uh, so over the last four years, we have been looking for options for broadband expansion. It's been difficult and a challenge because of our the size of our county and our density. Um, Comcast and Verizon, whether it's uh, Fios, doesn't really meet their business model to expand. And so we've had a lot of challenges with that. Um, our current board about four years ago started a process, created a broadband advisory committee of business owners, um, citizens and others, kind of went down a process to survey the county, survey need, and also did some uh, potential planning in terms of propagation if we did fiber, built towers, and other things. During that process, we received an unsolicited PPEA to do broadband services that in the end um, did not proceed. And through the process we've done since that time, two additional RFP processes um, with not a lot of success. Uh, however, we had done some pilot programs with a vendor to add transmission equipment to existing towers within the locality. And in the end, our broadband authority 
went into a comprehensive agreement with them to do incentives for them to install throughout the county transmission equipment um, to provide broadband service. It's a FCC license frequency that they use. So some of our geographical issues that uh, other providers couldn't address, this does because it's not line of sight. Um, and so far that went into place in September of last year. Uh, they've been able to get up onto 13 towers. That was not our original intent, but with COVID and just the lack of access for the majority of our citizens, we somewhat accelerated their process of getting onto those towers that we'd already planned. Um, in terms of what, based on the 13 towers that we've already put up, uh, they're covering within three miles, 70% of the properties within the county. Um, within five miles, it's about 91%. And then within seven miles, it's 97%. But in response to, we have a very significant amount of the people that do work within the county commute out into the Northern Virginia area. Teleworking is a huge issue for access as well as distance learning. Um, so as part of this, when we reviewed the CARES Act, one of the things that we determined was we could accelerate based on our county attorney's advice, uh, the number of towers that we were planning under this agreement and use the CARES money in order to do that because we're not actually constructing towers. Everything's going on to existing towers within the locality. Uh, we also have some protections under this comprehensive agreement that the incentives that the provider receives the county also has security agreements. So if they were to fail, we hold that equipment um, and it it's, makes it a little bit easier for us in terms of uh, perception as to how money is being allocated out. Um, so far, we've also implemented uh, through our GIS department a mapping tool so that any citizen can be essentially go on and determine which tower and access of providers that they have. Um, Comcast is really with only within our three incorporated towns and our service districts and outside of that it's it's fairly limited other than what we're currently doing. People really only have access to whether it's you know a MiFi device or satellite which isn't providing uh, significant download or upload speeds and it's pretty slow and it doesn't you know back to what Arlene was talking about is most people are using these MiFi devices for um, homework purposes, in most cases, the speeds that people were getting on those wasn't even conducive to kids doing homework. So the shift and expansion of the program that we're currently doing um, has significantly altered our abilities to plan for distance learning. Um, the provider also put up in the interim through a grant that we received from a local foundation, um, temporary hotspots across the county that both teleworkers and students could use in the months that school was still open. Um, it's definitely changed the discussion and access for us. It's, it's improved for a lot of people in the locality of how they can conduct business and how they can learn. Uh, but in terms of us using the CARES Act money, we believe because of the way the, the wording is within the FAQs that the Treasury put out, that it is allowable for us to do that since we aren't actually constructing, we're just installing. All right. Uh, Caroline, you there? If not, we can uh, kick it over to Mike. Yeah, thanks. Call. Yeah, yeah thanks Mike, if you just want to give a brief opener and then you can open it up to questions. Sure enough. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining the call. It's great. I, I have to refer back to Jeremy's statement. You know, when we work together, we do a lot of things better. So in this particular case, the the input from Arlington and Falk here are definitely valuable lessons, I guess, and also they're being successful. And so to start off, I'd just like to open the floor. Um, you can use star six if you're on the phone or just put something in the chat or unmute yourself through uh, the Google Meet uh, and uh, ask questions. Are there any questions for either Holly or Aaron? So I'll open it up right now for that. 
This is Mike Cannon from Stafford County. I just was curious uh, with the Fauquier example, um, was that data stream you're working with? It is data stream. Okay. And how many subscribers do they have now? If you can share that. Um, I don't have that number off hand just because some of the towers have only, I would say five towers have gone online in the last 30 days. Um, I do know that for the towers that have been on longer, we have over a thousand subscribers, Great. which keeping in mind uh, in terms of the number of households in Fauquier County, it's only around 23,000 households for those 71,000 people. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Yes. Hey, Mike, uh, Bill Hunter with County of Rona. Okay. Hey, Bill. Um, can, with this money having to be spent by December, is any kind of broadband construction project would be, I mean, unless you were locked and loaded, would be virtually impossible. And from what I understand right now, if you're planning fiber, is is the lag time to get fiber in is forever. So am I reading that right? Is if you were planning on this money has to be spent by the 31st of December. And and then my second question is, how does that affect your follow-up cost if you take on, you know, like Holly was talking about um, people's uh, expenses, how is that going to go over into 2021? So, so for I'm not answering the fiber question because I recognize that, but just from the 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 Comcast, what we're doing is a, is a prepayment. We're going to ask them to do a prepayment in the end of the year before. I think it's December 30th. It costs to before December 30th. This is a uh, Scott Barner from Frederick County. That's uh, one of my questions. Is we're setting up um, public Wi-Fi access at our fire stations in the western um, part of our county which is where we have the most trouble with coverage and our biggest question was you know the um, working with comcast and one of their subcontractors to manage the public wi-fi they're wanting uh you know a one-year contract commitment you know so our my first thought of being creative is well let's go ahead and let them bill us for a full year um, but of course you know we're we're trying to walk that fine line of making sure that we you know cover our expenses, but we don't want to run afoul of any of the rules either. So I don't know if any of you have thought about that, that ongoing monthly cost, because we don't know what schools right now, it looks like, you know, especially for kindergarten and first grade, there might at least be some kind of a alternating, you know, from home and in the seat. So we just don't know how long this is going to go on for. This is where for us, because we'll have not exact counts, but as we, roll this program out thinking that said late fall you'll have a, a sense of how many families have signed on and said and from that so we're paying monthly up until late fall and then estimate out the remainder of the contract and use that do that as a prepayment so but we have the way that our contract and specifically what we're targeting we will have data and we will have numbers to help us do that Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Holly, Aaron? And then I'll just start with Albemarle, if not, just a minute there. Saw Gary, you put Gary Silverman. Yeah, the two week delay on fiber. I think, you know, checking with county attorneys, city attorneys, you know, prepaying for that if you can is, is a possibility, but it's definitely due to your uh, looking at your purchasing rules, procurement rules um, would be beneficial. Make sure you go through those processes. Um, so, you know, in Albemarle, we've started two task for or a multiple task force for CRF. And just a reminder that, you know, it's smart or at least check every once in a while. May 28th, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury put in yet another uh, frequently asked questions for use of CRF specifically Corona relief funds. So that's what we're working on. And our the two groups that I've been assigned to are for 
human services and community services and economic development. So there seems to be a, a focus on using broadband to move those two forward rather than individual broadband projects. So just a different approach to how we're going to go through and get things done. Um, so we, we have to put together measurements. We have to understand what ideas we have. Uh, and then we have to verify that the funding for existing uh, projects is eligible. Um, so there's some things that we've already funded that we're going to put in and other things that we're planning to fund. So that, that would be uh, reviewed by a larger group, the leadership mentioned that we had earlier. And then we have to determine the estimate of the amount, how much money would be needed for a new project. Um, but at the end of the first phase, all of the groups will support a, a consideration and determination to a larger um, overall authorization. So likely going to the County Board of Supervisors for approval. Um, obviously, all of this is with the understanding that certain funding from the CRF will be dispersed for well-known requirements like allocation to our towns. Falkir, I think, has three or four, so they've probably already done that, figured it out, not to speak for them, but yeah. Um, reimbursement of costs for staff performing work specific to the public health emergency, which is, a, which is another caveat. All of this seems to have to have those three words in any project that we put forward. You have to mention with CRF, it goes hand in hand with the public health emergency. Um, so that purchased or pre-purchased equipment or service has to be related to support for the public health emergency. The other thing we have to consider is funds that are reimbursable through FEMA. So it may be, you know, hopefully the FEMA and CRF funds um, are understood and reimbursed close to the same time so that you're not um, looking at double dipping as a term or um, just getting to the to the right funding source for anything that we put together. So I was thinking the next conversation should be around two broadband buckets, either continuation of government ops during the public health emergency, operations of government. And then the second, and probably the one that we might have more ideas about, is providing funding for the non-government services, meaning maybe we should spend more time talking about how we get digital literacy and digital equity out to the citizenry um, in support of the 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 CARES Act funding CRF. So, you know, if there's ideas around there, um, some of the things we've been talking about are reimbursement of at-home use of internet access by government staff. So individuals who have gone to work from home. So a lot of counties I know are in more of a work from home environment now. Can we reimburse at-home use of internet access to individual staff? Um, and those people who are being called back to work from you know, being on furlough or not not working, and they still have a, a problem with bandwidth at their home, do we disperse hotspots? And I think this has been talked about before in MiFi's and places where the signal is strongest, there's a little bit of a lack of knowledge. I think it's, you know, people think you just hand out a MiFi and it's magically going to work at the person's home. Um, it's, it'll certainly vary. So the purchase of those mobile devices, um, including a data plan, may be something that's CRF. Then the libraries, we've talked a lot about these, those ideas, um, bringing up either temporary services at the library. All of our libraries and schools are providing public Wi-Fi, um, but could could we go a little bit further and, you know, either put temporary mast or uh, temporary cell phone towers on wheels, otherwise known as CAL, and strategically place them around rural areas. And then if those places open up so that we have government staff able to utilize the rural libraries or rural schools, we may be able to use CARES Act funding to reimburse the libraries and schools for those costs. You know, if there's someone who has to show up to the library to let the government staff in or at the school to let government staff in, and then if there's additional internet access costs during the public health emergency, those additional costs may be reimbursable. So I'll stop there and see if there's any other ideas or, you know, just add ons to those questions about specifically um, government operations, and then we'll move toward the specific citizen needs. So thanks for listening and uh, any good ideas or questions. Welcome.
Yeah, Kyle has a good question. Are any other localities have decided to use CARES Act funding on broadband related expenses? So open floor. So this is Scott Varner again with Frederick County. We are the, as I mentioned earlier, um, expanding our uh, broadband access into the parking lots at our fire stations in the area of the county that we have the most trouble getting signal to our ongoing effort through Vatty Grant and several other processes, you know, to get out there. That seemed to be the best help that we could make, uh, as well as we did acquire a new strip mall, hoping to uh, relieve some of our, um, you know, issues with the overcrowding at our Kent building. We now have a nice big area with a big parking lot. So we're lighting that one up as well. So we're planning on using funding for that. But also uh, we had mobile routers, um, cradle points and some pep waves that we issued to certain key essential workers for work from home. You know, we plan to submit for the cost for that um, for the ongoing monthly okay. uh, cost for that, as well as, um, you know, things like webcams. Uh, getting web cameras uh, in for some employees, but also for remote um, board meetings so that those joining remotely could see the entire dais. So there's lots of, you know, little expenses like that, that we, you know, um, the fire department, we needed to get in some laptops uh, for a lot of their workers. So those are quite a few of the expenses we're looking to help to hopefully cover. And then I'm hoping today to hear some more of things maybe I'm not thinking about that we can cover of our expenses as well on the call. I appreciate everyone who put this call together today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. At uh, Stafford County, we are looking at a number of um, requests that we've made that um, are going to be considered by our board today. Um, not sure if they'll get funded, but um, essentially uh, building some hotspots at drop off locations for free and reduced meals. Uh, at, you know, where the school buses that are dropping them off stop. Um, putting hot spots out at our fire stations, like Scott talked about. Um, also looking at um, getting Chromebooks for our students. Not all of our students have Chromebooks, um, which is essential, of course, too. They got to have the devices. Working with Cox and Comcast to provide service at some of these locations where the free and reduced meals are dropped off um, and also looking at places like trailer parks and others um, that uh, where there's a real need and um, perhaps a wireless signal could penetrate that area. And then, you know, trying to get our VATI grant um, co-applicant to, you know, speed up deployment and other things like that are also helping. And we're also looking at perhaps a mobile school bus where, you um, Kids could have a Khajiit attached to it and and social distance outdoors um, when that's possible. Um, so a whole variety of things we're trying to think of. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So this is Holly Hartel from Arlington County. Just adding, I think we're doing a lot of the things that others have talked about in addition to the Comcast and expanding our, our Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and also considering what does it mean for our workforce. Um, so not now we're a urban location and, and our issue with access for residences is, is affordability, not access, but not necessarily everybody lives within the county. And so considering what, what should be provided, is it a work from home package? Is it similar we have um, offsets for people who, who work um, in our, our main building, does that same type of thing need to be applied for people at home so that you're giving them a stipend and they can choose how to use it of what they're going to apply it? None of that has been decided, but it's all being discussed that we need to figure out how we can provide access to those at home. Um, in addition, as we are a, a Microsoft shop and we have increased our usage of Teams tremendously. Um, the, the board room is now, the board is now using teams to um, handle their board meetings. Our courts are using um, teams to handle um, court appearances and we're testing out using a surface, uh, a, a surface hub so that they can bring in more people mm -hmm. remotely, um, which I think has been very cool to see that come up and, and the usage of teams skyrocket. Yep, same here in Albemarle, except we're on Zoom with our board meetings. But uh, yeah, that's great, Arlington County. 
So Gary, I see you've been asking questions about um, the coalition map and counties who already have this service, uh, meaning fiber, I, I think you mean fiber. Any suggestions in negotiations with fiber providers? Well, the first one is, you know, make sure that your county works within the body guidelines and apply for funding. Um, and hopefully you have a, one or two fiber providers in your county who can support that uh, application. If you need, have any questions about that, you can certainly contact the DHCD or you can talk with me any way you want to go with that. Um, I'd like to move into the, you know, providing citizen services and, you know, a lot of the ideas about using the fire rescue, especially the rural fire rescue stations, whether they're volunteer or um, owned staff by full time staff. Um, that parking is is a, a very good location as long as you stay out of the way of the fire rescue operations uh, for people to access Wi Fi. Um, the other thing is you just I think it's important to look at all of your available parking space in the rural areas that can include churches and um, country stores, things like that, and potentially work through a process of uh, working with those businesses to open their parking lots for this type of thing and potentially apply for reimbursement for use of their internet. So if they're able to up their bandwidth, the difference in costs um, and allowing people to come in, it's just a thought. I know there's a lot behind that that would make it a valuable opportunity, but something we could do. Um, so considering that expanding capacity of internet with reimbursement, same thing with hosting, um, you know, a cowl, a, a, a cell phone tower on wheels. There may be an opportunity to have that temporarily placed in those locations. The other thing is about personnel issues, is, um, meaning temporary assistance um, and, and working with the libraries, you know, focusing on digital literacy. literacy um, there may be ways that we can uh, fund uh, temporary assist assistance for all of this, you know, how to apply for, for benefits, how to apply for a job, how to advance my career over the internet with training on virtual interview skills, and even, you know, coming to a place where I've got high-speed broadband so that I can participate in a virtual interview without my broadband connection dropping on me. So consistent access uh, to broadband is very critical when you're interviewing for a job. And then, uh, the vulnerable folks out there who need to connect with and participate in telehealth, it's certainly, you know, we're, we're working in the right direction. It's just during this emergency, you know, having people being able to come to a place where they've got reliable internet to talk to their providers online, those types of things. Just figuring out a way to reimburse for the professional services that are needed to help these people gain access to these new services. Uh, the way that we do life today is much different than five years ago and certainly a lot different than 10 years ago. Let's provide some support for people who don't know how to do that, you know, don't know how to access the internet to talk to their health provider, et cetera. Um, so reimbursement for the equipment used to provide these services. If something new is put in a library or there's a community room at a fire rescue station and we provide a professional who helps people gain access to the internet. Um, we pay for that cost and we also pay for the equipment that's used to provide these services during the public health emergency. So that's some of the things that we've been talking about. You know, a lot of places you have public health property that could host temporary cell and data services um, that, that could be put up. Working with the ISPs who have access to existing infrastructure, meaning, you know, uh, poles that they have fiber on or something else that would allow them to put up uh, wireless access points or something in locations on their on pole access. Um, talking to the power companies, you know, reimbursements for the cost for ISPs to gain access to their infrastructure on a temporary basis. And then for us in Albemarle, probably Falkir and other more rural counties, you know, temporary support for the agribusiness that's going on, um, providing them some way to get temporary deployment of wireless signal att attenuators or boosters put on their barn roofs or other vertical access so that assets so that they can um, gain access to the internet more quickly and with more robustness. 
And with that, I'll, I'll see if there's any other ideas or people doing anything to really support the citizenry or other ways that CRF could help. I see Cindy, Cynthia has put something in the libraries. Yep, there you go, about the public uh, digital literacy thing. Hi, this hey, is Bill, Bill Hunter again. I'm just curious as to what the thoughts are on providing these services to citizens who don't have them and then taking them away somewhere down the road. Yeah, yeah I, th I think you're right. There's a lot of this. Uh, the one-time cost is one great thing. I think uh, Arlington has a great example with their use of the Comcast Internet Essentials. Uh, the other things, you know, the farms, you know, what they're going to have to uh, assume all of the ongoing costs. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have to deactivate whatever type of equipment they put up on the, the barn roof or whatever. So it's just that initial cost to get them at least active again. So I think that's that's a really good question, Bill. And I think someone else was jumping in, too. Yeah, hi, this is Carol Steele from Gloucester. I was just going to mention um, one thing that I kind of thought was interesting. In looking at using CARES for telehealth, uh, we reached out to the um, health department because of the big emphasis on the public health aspect versus, you know, private facilities and that are also handling public health. But um, we, we talked with Riverside and um, with our free clinic, but in a conversation with the health director, um, health department director, he was not nearly as supportive of the telehealth um, process as I thought he would be. I thought it would be a great, you know, justification, but he said the majority of their clients are dealing with um, pregnancies, you know, family planning and sexually transmitted diseases, and they don't anticipate, um, at least in the near future, having a big expansion in telehealth. So that was kind of a, a letdown, but I know everywhere else it's still being used. Yeah. Thanks for that. This is Holly from Arlington County. Again, just going to respond to the earlier question about you know what what happens next is a one time, and and that that has been discussed. Um, recognizing that there is not going to be the CARES funding for for next year, and once you've provided this access, taking it away is not necessarily going to be something that you, you want or can do. Um, so the, the, there's already been discussion. Well, this would probably have to be an operating. Um, cost. But the other thing that I think is we're going to get that I'm very excited about is, is the data. So I know from um, census and ACS data, I can tell you there are around 7,000 households in Arlington. We're around 243,000 um, who do not have internet access. What I don't know is do they not want it or do they not need it? And this will help us to kind of get a better sense of what's the population um, that we should go after. Maybe it's operating, maybe it's Going back, so we have an infrastructure. We would love to be able to to utilize and provide access to to kind of help make that you know that case. This is Mike Cannon again from Stafford. Um, I have a question directed f um, for Cindy at the libraries. Um, I understand that the uh, E-rate restrictions have been lifted uh, and by the FCC, and I'm just curious how long that will be in place and. Uh, that's really an essential part of being able to provide some of these services, like our schools, for example, have opened up their parking lots and uh, turned over their Wi-Fi uh, to the public to be able to let students and the public connect. But that will only go on for so long. Um, what E-rate services were you, this is Cindy, um, thinking that were lifted? Because I know there's been some discrepancies. Uh, the ability for the public to be able to access um, an internet pipe that the schools might have, for example? Oh, well, I don't know that that's, that's, I don't know that that's different. I think that's kind of already been in place. I mean, I just try to make sure that, um, you know, when the schools are, you know, we, we have several um, collaborative projects already with the schools and the public libraries, making sure that when the, um, the pipe or broadband is laid, that the libraries get connected. So, um, because I've heard that the FCC is considering um, um, relaxing some with uh, the hotspots in terms of E-rate funding, but I don't know if that's a definite or not. I hope that, I'm sorry, if it didn't answer your question specifically, please email me and I will be happy to follow up as well. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, and I'm curious if anyone else is looking at that then 
um, as far as you know the hot spots at schools and opening them up to the public and are there issues with that using schools internet pipes yeah that's a that's a good question I know our school division has been doing so at 25 different locations because they're all connected to fiber so they've had good success there but I haven't talked with the CTO dr. Diggs about whether or not that's a they have to uh, you know what is it like a distribution if you're using it for public you have to figure out what yeah. your distribution is but um, it's a good, this is good Cindy point. I don't think they're doing I mean to me it's internet is internet I mean that's kind right. of the focus of this conversation anyway I mean you know um, based on what the person from Arlington said too I mean you know we we've got a problem across the board it's not just the families trying to do get homework done but just families trying to do anything and everything so I don't I don't think there's a restriction per se um, in, in those kind of things yeah so we're getting close to the end of the time Caroline do you want to talk about next steps or Kyle either either one sure um, so first off thank you to all the panelists and thank you for everyone who joined today and I love hearing such good conversation around this um, you know, that's that's why we created the VLBN is so that Virginia locality schools and libraries had a had a place that they could go and um, collaborate together. And, um, you know, this is certain broadband in general is certainly an issue that affects us all. So um, with that being said, please feel free to utilize the email list, the VLBN email list. Um, there's a reason why we don't blind copy people on there, and that's because we want the, it to be a discussion. Um, with that being said, uh, this group has grown exponentially, and um, there has been some good conversation. So um, I know that that there has been a little, at times there's been too many emails for folks. We are looking at different platforms. Um, we were considering Microsoft Teams for a little while, but I, I'm afraid that not everybody would be able to join. Um, so we're, we are looking at other options, but until then, please feel free to use the, um, the emails. Um, we will be posting the, um, the slides and the recording of uh, this call on the Commonwealth Connect site. I'm putting in the link in the chat box, but um, for those of you on the phone, it's uh, commonwealthconnect.virginia.gov, and there's a page on there specifically for the VLBN. Um, so if, if you need the slides, um, and I know uh, um, it might be a little hard to see people's contact information on this slide, so um, it'll be up there, and you know if you have specific questions, please, direct them either to the panelists or again feel free to utilize the network that's that's what it's here for um, so if if anyone else has anything they'd like to add um, please do so now or if not we're a little past our time so we can we can call it a day All right, well, um, again, thank you everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. And, um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Kyle Rosner. Thanks for 